Hello and welcome to the second of two class apps on Japan's Constitution. I'm Ethan Siegel, a professor of Japanese history at Michigan State University, and your guide through this two-part exploration of Japan's Constitution. I'm delighted to be working with the University of Colorado's Program for Teaching East Asia, which is bringing you this class app as part of its project, Japan's Olympic Opportunity. The project has received generous support from the NCTA, the National Consortium for Teaching About Asia. In part one, which is a separate video, I explained why Japan's post-war constitution is so significant, provided some historical background on government in Japan and on the earlier Meiji constitution, and covered in detail the U.S. occupation of Japan and the processes, negotiations, and debates that led to the passage and implementation of the 1947 Constitution. In this video, we'll look at how the post-war Constitution came to be accepted and embraced by many in the Japanese public, as well as calls by some politicians to amend the Constitution or to rewrite it entirely. Talk of constitutional revision has been in the news a lot in recent years, especially since the current Prime Minister, Shinzo Abe, and his ruling political party, the LDP, or Liberal Democratic Party, are eager to bring about constitutional reform. And since they won a major victory in elections in the upper house earlier this year, in 2016. So we'll look at the history of the constitution over the 70 years since it came into effect, but focus in particular on what these LDP reformers hope to accomplish and why. Some of the questions that we'll explore in this app include, how did the new constitution of 1947 come to be embraced by the Japanese people? What efforts have been made to change it, especially the controversial Article 9? What are the current proposals for constitutional reform, and what areas of society would they impact if they are put into place? What I think you'll learn might be surprising, at least if all you see about Japan and its constitutional debates is what appears in the mainstream American media. Three points that are challenged by my presentation include, first, that most Japanese, or at least a significant percentage of them, don't actually seek to alter the Constitution in any way. Second, that the minority who do want to see the Constitution changed have been around for a long time, at least in various forms. They aren't just the result of Prime Minister Abe's efforts. And lastly, the proposals for revision do not only address Article 9, the renunciation of war clause, but other aspects of society as well. Japan's constitution is very much a product of the U.S. occupation and the late 1940s. Historian Richard Finn quotes General Douglas MacArthur, who led the occupation as the supreme commander of the Allied powers, referring to it as, quote, probably the single most important accomplishment of the occupation, end quote. Similarly, Sato Tatsuo, a formal high official and constitutional scholar, refers to it as, quote, a beautiful jewel that came out of a senseless war, end quote. But it was during the occupation, actually, that the first challenge to the constitution arose, and it was from one of the bodies supposedly in charge of the occupation, the so-called Far Eastern Commission. Now, the Far Eastern Commission included representatives from all of the Allied powers, and in theory anyway, MacArthur answered to it, but in reality, he often did what he wanted, and the commission was surprised to learn that MacArthur had pushed for a new constitution without consulting it first. 
They urged for a review of the document within one to two years of its passage and followed through in 1948 and 1949, calling for clarification of things such as the Japanese Supreme Court's ability to evaluate legislation for its constitutionality. But not much came of their efforts, although it would not be the last time that powers outside of Japan would call for constitutional changes. Within Japan, the Constitution quickly gained acceptance among most members of the general public. I spoke in Part 1 about the Committee for Popularizing the Constitution, which surely helped. But even without that committee's efforts, there were many reasons why the public embraced the new Constitution. For one, people were weary from 15 years of war in Asia and the Pacific. In fact, the term often used was kyodatsu, which is often translated as exhaustion. They were tired of sacrifice, tired of doing everything in the name of the emperor, and happy, in many cases, to see the emperor's role change to a symbol of the state. In the photo here, you see the emperor on one of many tours he made to visit with his people. On some occasions, members of the public confronted him, angry about Japan's defeat, or, more relevantly, about the food, housing, and work shortages that many Japanese endured in the immediate post-war period. And yet, perhaps paradoxically, SCAP and the Japanese government used residual respect for the emperor to help legitimize the new constitution. They had the emperor formally announce its acceptance and his endorsement of it on November 3rd, 1946, which was already a holiday to commemorate the birthday of his grandfather, the Meiji Emperor. So, somewhat ironically, the backing of the emperor may have helped win acceptance for the constitution among some in the public. Japanese political leaders, however, were much more divided. On the political right, some conservatives, most notably Prime Minister Yoshida, favored accepting the constitution and avoiding divisive questions such as whether or not to remilitarize by instead focusing on rebuilding the economy. Other conservatives, such as Hatoyama Ichiro, wanted greater power restored to the emperor and for Japan to have a real independent military. These conservatives found the constitution objectionable. On the political left, the socialists embraced the constitution, especially the renunciation of war clause and Article 25, which held that all people are entitled to wholesome and cultured living and that the state must promote social welfare and public health. However, the communists objected to the constitution because it allowed the continuation of the emperor system. Ultimately, Prime Minister Yoshida's approach prevailed and came to be institutionalized in something known as the Yoshida Doctrine, avoid remilitarization, focus on the economy. This became one factor behind Japan's rapid rise to become the world's number two economy by the late 1970s. However, although Yoshida prevailed, there were contentious debates, contested elections, and even some efforts at constitutional reform in the 1950s. Japan regained its independence in 1952, but in 1954, conservative rivals forced Yoshida from power. For six years, Hatoyama and then his ally Kishi served as prime minister. In 1956, they initiated a constitutional revision committee, which began a multi-year study of possible reforms. But Hatoyama and Kishi's efforts at changing the direction of Japan's foreign policy and renegotiating the security treaty with the United States ended in failure. Although Kishi's government successfully pushed through the new treaty in 1960 over the objections of all of the opposition parties, it led to huge mass protests by the citizenry, as more than one million people took to the streets in the so-called Ampo riots. You see one photo of the demonstrators here on the slide. Kishi had to step down from the prime minister's post. He was replaced by Ikeda Hayato, a Yoshida disciple who famously announced plans to double people's average income within 10 years. His focus was on the economy, not on constitutional reform or remilitarization. And it worked. People became caught up in the growing economy and enjoying better living standards, and Ikeda's plan reached its goal in just seven years. When the Constitutional Revision Committee released its report during his administration, not many people were interested anymore. In addition, the Socialists, although never in power at this time, held enough seats as a minority in Parliament to block any efforts at modifying the Constitution. In 
so there were few calls for change in the 1960s or 70s. Some Japanese nationalists, however, renewed calls for constitutional change in the 1980s as they became increasingly proud of their country's rise to economic superpower status. In the words of historian Ken Pyle, they sought to discredit the Constitution by pointing out its foreign authorship, imposed nature, and the alien ideas that informed it. Writer Eto Jun held that Article 9 reflected a fundamental distrust of Japan, but that it was now time for it to be revised. Other writers argued that, without true military strength, Japan was not a real state. Among the more famous works criticizing the U.S.-Japan relationship, writer Ishihara Shintaro and Sony founder Akio Morita published a book titled The Japan That Can Say No, in which they urged Japan to free itself from dependence on the United States. Yet curiously, the LDP prime minister for most of the 1980s, Nakasone Yasuhiro, did not push as strongly for constitutional revision as he might have. It is in the 21st century that the most serious calls for reform have been issued, and they have not centered exclusively on Article 9. For example, in 2000, the lower house of parliament convened a research commission on the constitution that issued, five years later, a report over 800 pages in length that included proposals for everything from greater environmental and privacy protections to restructuring government. And in 2012, the LDP published the draft of a revised constitution reflecting its priorities. In the announcement, the LDP claimed its draft included, quote, numerous proposals for constitutional amendments that will unshackle the country from the system established during the occupation and make Japan a truly sovereign state, end quote. However, it's not so easy to change the constitution, and that is by design. There is a provision for it, Article 96, which dictates that proposed changes must pass each House of Parliament with a two-thirds majority and then be approved by the voters in a national referendum. Although the LDP has enjoyed being part of majority coalitions for most of its existence, those coalitions have rarely had a two-thirds majority in Parliament. In fact, the hurdle seemed so high that in 2013, Prime Minister Abe tried to change Article 96 to lower the threshold, but he gave up after incurring severe criticism. Numerous public opinion polls over the years show that many Japanese are content with the Constitution. Most voters who support Abe do so because they hope he will turn around the economy, not because they agree with his plans to revise the Constitution. What are the issues that Abe and other right-wing figures wish to see changed? Well, let's start with Article 9, which is surely at the top of the list. Here you see the text of this famous provision, the only constitutional article whereby a nation forgoes the right to go to war or have a standing army. It is because of this provision that many refer to this document as the Peace Constitution. Although General MacArthur claimed that Prime Minister Shidehara proposed the idea to him, it is more likely that MacArthur insisted on a provision like this himself. Yet the meaning of Article 9 is open to interpretation. The government maintains that it permits its self-defense forces, which in fact are a military under another name and a top 10 military in the world at that. But that probably was not MacArthur's original intention. MacArthur's initial instructions to his staff when he commissioned them to write the Constitution included only a few specific provisions, but one of those was that Japan would renounce, it, renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation, including even for preserving its own security, and that no Japanese army, navy, or air force would ever be authorized. But a member of his staff, Charles Cades, whom you see here on the screen and who was discussed in the Part 1 video of this class app, thought that denying any nation the right to even defend itself was going too far, and so he took that part of the provision out of his draft. As a result, the version that SCAP gave to the Japanese government in February of 1946 is what you see here on the screen. But while the constitution was being debated in the Japanese parliament, Ashida Hitoshi, a Diet member who chaired the Constitutional Amendment Committee, and who later chaired the Committee to Popularize the Constitution, made further modifications. He added phrases to the start of each section of Article 9. You can see them underlined here. 
Those changes, known as the Ashida Amendment, were incorporated into the final version and are part of Japan's constitution even today. His goal was to create justification for Japan to rearm for defensive purposes by having those opening clauses in each sentence make Japan's use of military force allowable under certain circumstances. American occupation staff did not object. In fact, very soon after the Constitution's passage, Americans would begin pressuring the Japanese to change Article 9 and rearm. This American change of heart was part of a broader shift in the occupation, often called the reverse course. While the Americans had initially sought to reform Japan during the first few years of the occupation, by the late 1940s, they instead wanted Japan to recover so that it would be a stable, strong ally in the Pacific. Why? The Cold War, of course. China had fallen to the communists in 1949, and many Americans were worried about the worldwide spread of communism. The Korean Peninsula was divided into a communist north and supposedly democratic south, and of course, just a year later, war would erupt on the Korean Peninsula. Just a few months after the start of the Korean War, under American pressure, Prime Minister Yoshida created the National Police Reserve. Four years after that, in 1954, Japan's self-defense forces were born. Though concerns about militarism led the Japanese parliament to also pass a law forbidding the SDF, the self-defense forces, from being dispatched overseas. Although some tried to claim the SDF were unconstitutional, the Supreme Court refused to render a decision on the matter. There have been continued tensions over Article 9 and the existence of the SDF ever since. In 1960, when the U.S. and Japan signed a new mutual security treaty, some objected because Japan would not be able to dispatch its forces to aid Americans if they came under attack, whereas the opposite would hold. If Japanese were attacked, Americans had to come to their aid. In the early 1990s, Japan was sharply criticized by other nations for sending no troops, only money, to help fight the first Gulf War, the war to liberate Kuwait. This led Japan to pass a new law known as the PKO Law, or Peacekeeping Operations Law, which would allow the SDF to participate overseas in United Nations peacekeeping operations as long as they were not part of active combat zones. The 2005 report and 2012 LDP draft constitution both call for open recognition of the SDF as Japan's military and wholesale revision of Article 9 so that Japan will have a normal military and, in truth, many American diplomats and military officials would be supportive of such a change. But this is precisely what many Japanese citizens, especially those old enough to remember the dark days of World War II, are afraid of. It's common these days to see groups of protesters on street corners, at public gatherings, and especially at events where the Prime Minister will speak. Holding signs and speaking through bullhorns in an effort to galvanize support in favor of keeping Article 9. I saw them during my most recent trip to Tokyo earlier this year, and I saw them last year in Hiroshima, where I traveled to join with tens of thousands of other people from around the world for the 70th commemoration of the destruction of that city by the atomic bomb. Given the geopolitical realities of the region, namely a North Korean state that is hostile, unpredictable, and has already fired missiles at Japan, and the People's Republic of China, which is aggressively claiming various islands and expanded territorial waters, which has put it into conflict with several neighboring states, including Japan. It seems hard to imagine Article 9 remaining as is for much longer. In addition, the major victory by the LDP and its coalition partners in the upper house elections of July 2016 mean that Prime Minister Abe and his allies now have the two-thirds supermajority needed to bring about constitutional revision. Although Abe has not immediately moved for reform and acknowledges that changing the constitution will still require much discussion and investigation, left-leaning groups in Japan that seek to protect the constitution are quite concerned, as are Japan's neighbors, China and the two Koreas, which still remember and resent Japanese military aggression against them during the Second World War. But Article 9 isn't the only part of the Constitution that LDP politicians aim to change if they push through reform. In 
Even a cursory reading of the party's 2012 draft constitution shows that they are interested in fundamentally altering the relationship between people and the government. They're critical of what they see as Western values reflected in the current constitution and seek to revise articles on the status of women and the rights of individuals. This is clear even in the preamble. In the current constitution, the preamble begins with the people asserting their sovereignty and their commitment to peace. By contrast, the LDP's proposed preamble opens by talking about Japan's long and unique history and culture, the importance of the emperor, and defending Japan's territory. In addition, although it acknowledges the importance of respecting fundamental human rights, it goes on to assert the value of harmony and describes the nation as a collection of families that support each other. You see here a quote from a leader of the Japan Conference, a right-wing group dedicated to constitutional reform. The language it employs calls to mind pre-war Japan, when the value of harmony was used to justify limiting rights to free speech and assembly, and when families, rather than individuals, were regarded as the basic units of society. Similar provisions appear in the proposed Constitution's articles. For example, Articles 11, 12, and 13 recognize human rights, but also require the people to refrain from abusing those rights and to recognize that with rights come responsibilities and duties. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are guaranteed, but only to the extent that they do not interfere with public interest and public order. Article 21 suggests new limits on freedom of the press and freedom of assembly. Article 24 asserts that families are the natural and fundamental unit of society and that family members must support each other. These and other provisions of the draft constitution suggest a broad shift to the right for Japanese society, what some scholars see as a shift toward illiberal government or even autocracy. Yet many oppose such changes, including, curiously, the emperor himself. Emperor Akihito has, since assuming his position in 1989, long affirmed his support for the current constitution. Earlier this year, in 2016, he garnered worldwide attention when he spoke of his desire to abdicate due to declining health. In that speech, he repeatedly referred to the current constitution and his role as a symbol of the state and someone who listens to the people and prays for all people's peace and happiness. It's a very different message than what we read in the LDP draft constitution. Although the emperor is not allowed to speak openly of political matters, such as constitutional revision, it seems clear that he himself does not favor the types of reforms called for in the LDP draft. Well, the Constitution is about to turn 70. Although it has endured for seven decades without any amendment, there are provisions for amendments, and it's up to the Japanese people themselves whether or not to bring about changes. Given the international and military tensions in the region, the current dominance of the right-wing LDP and its coalition partners, and the reality that most voters today have no direct memory of wartime Japan, it seems likely that some constitutional changes will take place in the near future. Hopefully, they will not also be accompanied by other changes to society which negatively affect women's status or the rights of individuals and their liberties. As Japan is an important world power and major U.S. ally, we need to pay attention to these developments. I hope these two class apps will help you to better understand them. Thank you.